Lord dying. I'm excited about that. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 again, if you would please. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse number 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, I, those three verses, I keep coming back there, I've been there several Sunday nights in a row now. I do not apologize for that because these verses tell us a few things. You ready for this? Number one, God saves us. He saves us. And He saves us eternally. And then I like this, He keeps us saved. So He saves us he keeps us saved. And then I like this too, that there's an inheritance that we don't fully realize yet, but it's real and it's coming and it's reserved and it's waiting. And yet right now, the reason we don't see what all is coming is because of what we have to deal with right now. If Can you imagine if heaven throughout eternity was all going to be like what we're living right now. Can anybody imagine that being heaven? No, I mean, we just heard a wonderful song about it. On heaven's bright shore, there'll be no more dying. Not one little grave uh, over there. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, we'll sing His praise through endless days on heaven's bright shore. I, I'm looking forward to that because there is a, a fullness of joy that is waiting yet to come. Now our joy can be full right now. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Our joy can be full right now. But I think, it, I think we could say it like this. Full to the capacity of our own ability to understand it. But what happens is there's coming a day when our capacity is going to open up. And we're going to begin to realize things that we can't realize with our finite minds and our limited uh, human existence right now. But there's things that we're looking forward to. Watch what he says here in verse number 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations temptations. Now look over with me a little bit later in the chapter and he says here in verse number 18 for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by Him do believe in God, that raised Him up from the dead, and gave Him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now look back in one more passage in this chapter. I want you to see where he says in, uh, in uh, verse number 
uh, 6 again, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Then he talks about that salvation that the prophets desired to look into. But he says in verse number 13, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, pay attention to this phrase, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to call this, I've, I've titled this message, and I don't title messages unless they just fall in my lap, but I titled tonight's message, Heavy but Hopeful. Heavy but Hopeful. Now in light of this morning's comment about the fact that I might preach on our eating habits, I realize that title could lead your mind in a wrong direction when I say heavy but hopeful. But I'm not talking about heaviness like, uh, you know, how much the number reads when we stand on the scale. But I'm talking about the fact that if your life is not going through some sort of heaviness right now, if you keep living, it will. Because we all have to go through heaviness at times, but we never have to go through heaviness without hope as a child of God. And I want to look at some scriptures tonight. We're going to depart from the text, and that's not something that I normally do. But tonight I want to depart from the text, and we're going to look at some scriptures tonight that I believe are going to be an encouragement to you and a blessing to help you know that no matter how heavy life is on your shoulders, there is always hope for the believer. And I'm going to show you the reason why tonight. Heavenly Father, we've already been to you in prayer and thank you that we can come again and again and again in the name of your Son and spend time in prayer with you, Lord, and ask for your blessing, ask for your help, and certainly we need your help tonight uh, in the preaching time to both uh, for me to articulate and for all of us to understand and make application in our daily lives. It's what we need, God. We need your word, not just heard, but put into action. And we pray that you'd help us to know exactly how you'd have us to do that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn uh, from 1 Peter. I want you to go toward the back of your Bible to 1 John chapter 2 tonight. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse number 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Now, can you look up here for just a second? We do know, I know we're independent Baptists tonight, but we do know that God does not want us to sin. That, that seems basic. But I find that it needs to be said every now and then. We need to be reminded that God does not want us to sin. God does not want us living in sin. And sometimes we talk about grace and forgiveness like we just like like those two uh, those two uh, uh, characteristics of God just give us license to do whatever, and God's just going to forgive us and we're going to go on. But we are admonished in the Bible to crucify the flesh and to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and to live holy lives unto God. It is in the Bible. That, that, that is God's commandment to us. And so he wrote chapter 1 to believers to encourage them that they sin not. But then he says this, And if any man sin, and you and I read that and we probably think this, what does he mean if? Well, the reason he says if is because 
If we truly have victory in Jesus, it is possible to live above sin. It is possible to live holy because of our salvation, because of what God has equipped us to. But the reality is this, we're still going to fail. We're still going to make mistakes. And sometimes I feel like the word mistake is used to soften the blow of just saying we fail, we sin against God, we transgress against God. So he says, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This is good news because when it comes to judgment and the reason Paul was able to tell the church at Rome that there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus is because the one who stands before God on our behalf is righteous. And it is through him that God sees us. And so here we are, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I thought about, and I don't nobody raise your hand, but I thought about saying tonight, Raise your hand if you've ever had to go to court for something you did wrong. But I don't want you to have to raise your hand to that. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not going to ask you to confess to the whole church tonight uh, your wrongdoings. But uh, uh, I, I remember uh, having to appear in court uh, for a traffic ticket. Now the reality is I didn't have to appear in court. I could have just paid the ticket. But I chose to appear in court because I thought I have a, had a case and I didn't. Uh, and, 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 but anyway, I, I uh, chose to talk to the prosecutor and, uh, and, and the prosecutor said, well, I can see why, you're, why you wanted to talk. You obviously have a clean record and you don't want this uh, traffic ticket on your record. I understand that. And because you don't have a, a clear record, then I think we can, uh, you're still going to have to pay a fine, but I think we can work some things out to where this is not going to appear on your permanent record and we can, we can, uh, uh, we can work with you here. And I, I didn't have to stand before a judge. But that day while I was sitting in court waiting to talk to the prosecutor, I did see many people go before the judge. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care if it's a municipal, I'll just tell you, city of republic court, yep, they're the ones, you know, that's their uh, main monetary stream is uh, P Highway traffic tickets right there. I'm pretty sure that's their main source of income right there. And uh, anyway, I was, I was sitting in Republic's courthouse, and you say this is just, a, I mean, it's just a small town municipal court. I'm going to tell you right now, standing before any judge is an austere thing. It's a reverential thing. And here's what I saw. I saw people appear before him with an advocate and without an advocate. And I made up my mind right then and there, if I ever have to appear before a judge, I want an advocate. I want someone to speak for me. Because I saw people speak for themselves and it was something like this. Because they might, they might have come into that court that day thinking, I'm going to tell this judge this and I'm going to tell him this and I'm going to tell him how the cow ate the cabbage, but when they're standing before that bench, and there's a bailiff right there, and there's other people standing around, and he's up there, and you're down here, and he holds your fate in his hands, it's more like, uh, 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 uh. And it doesn't quite go like you planned on it going when you walked in there. And that's the way it ought to be, to just be honest with you. That's the way it ought to be. But think about standing before the God of all the universe having sinned. I want an advocate. <laughs> I want somebody who can speak for me. And not just that, he appears for me. He appears before the judge for me. Now guess what? Oh, I, I, I'm going to skip ahead to future messages in the coming months. But the reality is the same one who the Bible says is my advocate will also be judge of all the earth. Now get this, when your advocate, the one who talks for you, who's on your side, is also the judge, somebody says that's not a fair court system. Well it is with God. 
As a matter of fact, the only one who's not on my side in this whole thing is the accuser of the brethren, the old devil. And he doesn't have a word to say because he's already been defeated on Calvary's cross. And Colossians says that Christ made a show of him openly, triumphing over him. So his reign is done. He has nothing to say about me. But even if he stood before God and told the truth about me, God wouldn't know what he was talking about. Why? Because my sins have been forgiven. My sins have been washed away. And I have an advocate to stand on my behalf, and he is Jesus Christ the righteous. Moreover, he's not just my advocate, verse number 2, and he is the propitiation. I love big words. I'm a little guy who likes big words. It, that word doesn't fit into normal everyday conversation very often. But propitiation is not a hard word, it just means this. It's when someone is wrathful towards somebody else, if the wrath of that person who, who has a case against someone is appeased so that they are not against that individual anymore and all is good, that's propitiation. Propitiation means the wrath of the one who's been wronged, wronged has been appeased. And Jesus became the propitiation for us. He satisfied God's wrath toward our sin by His death upon the cross. And He is the propitiation for our sins. And in case there's any Calvinists in the room, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. Don't, don't try to tell me that Jesus' death was only for the elect. That is not Scripture. That is not Bible. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God toward all sin, even the sins of the whole world. Now, I'm going to refer back to this passage in just a minute, but right now I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, in chapter 14. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Let me just encourage you real quick. Um, I was talking this past week uh, with a good friend of mine, Brother Russ Bishop, down in Edmond, Oklahoma. He's preaching a series at Lighthouse Baptist Church where he pastors on Sunday nights. He's been doing this for, I think, about two years now. And he's preaching on the words in red in the gospel. The words that Jesus spoke. A fascinating idea for a series. I might even steal the idea from him at some point. But when you look in the middle of John, at John chapter 14, and you turn the pages, you see a little bit of black, but mostly red. And that's because John 14, 15, and 16 was where Jesus just clears off a spot before his, his arrest and after the Last Supper with his disciples and he just teaches his some disciples things that they're going to desperately need to know. And John 14, 15, 16, I'm going to throw 17 in there which is red too because that's Jesus talking to his father before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. But John 14, 15, 16, and 17 must read for every Christian on a regular basis. You need encouragement? Go to John 14 through 17 and read that and be reminded of what Jesus taught his disciples. But, but this was one of the most important things that he wanted to communicate to them. And furthermore, this was a brand new idea unknown to humanity a brand new idea unknown to humanity period that Jesus is going to teach them in John 14 verse number 16 Jesus says and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter 
that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit, capital S, notice that, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now let me tell you why this is mystery revealed. Let me tell you why this is truth previously unknown. Somebody says, well, the Holy Spirit wasn't involved at all in the Old Testament. No, read the, read the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was there, and He had very real ministry in the Old Testament. But the Holy Spirit would only, in the Old Testament, come upon individuals for a particular purpose and for a particular time. So, for example, after uh, Saul was anointed to be king, there were times that the Holy Spirit came upon him as king of Israel to accomplish certain purposes. But when he rejected the authority of God and did what he wanted to do, God removed his Holy Spirit from him. And without the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Saul's life, he went mad. He went insane. And it's evidenced by the course of his life following that. That prompted David later on, who knew the Holy Spirit upon him for most of his life and ministry, it prompted him when he had sinned and was now confessing that sin to God, some of you might remember this, that he specifically asked the Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So he says, why would he, why would he pray that? I, I don't really understand that. Because in the Old Testament... God would put His Spirit upon someone for a particular function and for a particular purpose, but the Holy Spirit could be removed from that person. And no doubt David had seen that happen to his predecessor Saul. And now that David was in sin before God, uh, and in his repentance and his turning from sin, he prayed that God would not remove His Holy Spirit from him, and in fact, God did not remove His Holy Spirit from him for this reason. When these men were both confronted with their sin, <clears throat> one said, I have not sinned. And when he was confronted further about it, blamed it on the people. But the other one, when he was confronted with sin, said, I have sinned. And I'm sorry. That was wrong. I was wrong. You, God, are right. And I want you to forgive me, <coughs> pardon me, and I want you to lead me in the right way. And so those things happened in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come upon prophets. The Holy Spirit was upon John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit descended upon Christ himself as a dove at the time of his baptism. And he was able to even accomplish certain miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit that was upon him. Let me move forward. Now Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 14 that the comforter, another comforter that I will send, that he will come and he will be with you. That's not unknown. The Spirit was with people in the past. But he will be in you. In other words, what Jesus says to the disciples is, that coming up, not too far from now, there's going to be a time when the Holy Spirit actually takes up permanent residence within you. The Holy Spirit is going to come and He's going to dwell in you. He's not just going to be with you like He was at that time. He shall be in you. And then He follows it up with this verse in verse number 18. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Now, I'm going to preach a few things that might be a little bit hard to wrap your brain around because there's some certain concepts of our God that are really tough for our brain, if not impossible for our brain to grasp. And that is this, the oneness of a triune God. That we have one God that represents himself to man in three distinct persons. So here's what Jesus said. I'm going away in person. 
Now keep this in mind for a second. When Jesus was born of Mary in Bethlehem, oh, let me go back. When Jesus was conceived in Mary, God took upon himself human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You might be interested to know that the Bible teaches that though he is glorified, Jesus is still in human flesh today. Now, God the Father is still spirit. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is still spirit, and they are still one God. But the Son of God sits at the right hand of the throne of God, but he still was able to say to the disciples, I will come to you, and how would he come to them? In the flesh, like he had in his earthly ministry? No. By the Holy Spirit coming to live within them. Sure enough, Jesus gets arrested later that night. The next day he's crucified. He's buried in a tomb. Three days, three nights, he raises from the grave. And then, days after that, he ascends back to the Father, just as he told them on this night that he was going to do. And just a few days after that, while they wait for him in Jerusalem... God fulfills His promise. Jesus does exactly what He says He's going to do. He does not leave them comfortless. He comes unto them by the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. And so He has done for every person that has put their faith in Christ since the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And He comes to be a... Comforter. A comforter. I always used to read this, and I'm going to be honest with you, I would pass right by it. I would skip right over it. That Jesus said this. I've told you this this morning. I love details in the Word of God. Did you notice Jesus said this in verse 16? I will send you another comforter. Another means in addition to, but not the same one. Now, this Greek word comforter means, uh, it doesn't mean, the Greek word there that we have our word comforter is the word parakletos. Now you say, I really needed to know that. I don't, I don't know why you would tell us that. Because I find this interesting. When I study the Bible and I do word, word studies and things like that, I often look back to what was written in the Greek and, and uh, not that our English translation is not the word of God or it is not acceptable, but what I'm saying is, I, and just being honest with the word and looking, doing the study and homework that I need to do to rightly divide, I often look back to, to the Greek and there's this word parakletos. So through some word study helps that I have, I want to find out, is this word used anywhere else? Well, yeah, it's used in chapters 15 and 16 too when Jesus talks about this comforter that's going to come, the parakletos. But then there was something that stood out to me. It's also used in 1 John chapter 2 when John writes, and we have a parakletos with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, an advocate. So when Jesus, now look, 1 John 2 is in specific reference to Jesus. He is our advocate. Very correct usage of the word in its context. But it explains why Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. Because if you want to look at it like this, we have multiple comforters as a child of God. We have Jesus who is an advocate for us before the Father, the propitiation for our sins, the one who stands and speaks on our behalf. But as if that wasn't enough, Jesus sends another comforter to live within us. So watch this, this is exciting. So I have a comforter or an advocate or someone who is looking out on my behalf. I have one seated at the right hand of God and I have one who lives within me. 
Listen, I'm pretty sure that covers it. I've got one who speaks to me, and I've got one who speaks to God on my behalf. There's, there is nothing that is not covered in that. Now, let me ask you this. Why would Jesus say to his disciples that I'm going to send you another comforter and he's not talking about a quilt for their bed. But when he says I'm going to send you another comforter and then he says I will not leave you comfortless. Why would he say that if Jesus didn't know that the disciples are going to go through some heaviness? from time to time. That they're going to need some comfort. Please, please listen to me very carefully here. I'm so thankful for friends that God's given me in my life. I'm so thankful for close people that who in difficulties and hard times have come along, put their arm around me and said, hey, I'm, I just want you to know, I'm here for you. Anything I can help with. Uh, man, that means a lot, doesn't it, to have friends like that? But there's not a person sitting in here tonight that doesn't know about heaviness that not one human being could ever help with. Can I say that again? There are certain types of heaviness that we go through in our life that people with all their love, affection, and good attentions, they can't comfort us. They can't. Well, I, I, uh, I, you, you say, I, I want to be that kind of friend. I, I want to help people. If I, just, if I just know what they're struggling with, then I can help. And I'm just saying, all of us have gone through things that people have offered to help, and you just had to say something like this, I, I, I don't think there's anything you can do. Or you might say like this, the only thing I know to ask for is, would you pray for me? Because basically what you're saying is, while, while your offer of help is an encouragement, you can't comfort the heaviness in the situation that I'm going through. And somebody goes, well, does that mean that we're alone then in our heaviness? Never alone. Not if you're a child of God. Have you ever, have you ever been in a situation where you were surrounded by people that you knew, these people really love me, these people really have my best interests in mind, but none of them can do anything for, for what's hurting right in here. Not, none of them can, can really address the root of the problem that I'm dealing with. Because as human beings, as much as we love one another, as much as we try to be there for one another, as much as we encourage for one another, there are just some things we can't do. Why? Because only God can. Because only God can. And I want to tell you, when you're in that heaviness, don't let the clouds of those circumstances drown out the light of God's countenance. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Jesus is very much aware that they are going to go through some difficult times. There, there is going to be struggles, but he says, he says, here's what I'm going to do. I will pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Jesus says, hey, 
I'm going to be the common ground here. I'm going to be the glue that holds this thing together. Because when the Holy Spirit of God, in that day, when the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell in you, then you're going to know that I am in my Father and that I am in you. And I'm going to pull this situation together. And he says, verse number 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And then, of course, Judas asks a question here. By the way, this is not Judas Iscariot. He's already left the picture. There's just 11 men standing there at that time. And he says, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. And so they go on, and then he begins to teach them about oneness. How as a branch, you need to be attached to the vine and drawing your life and sustenance from the vine. And that's how, the, that's how it works uh, with the Father uh, being the uh, husbandman and him being the true bride true vine and we being the branches and then he goes down and in uh, chapter 5 and he says uh, uh, in verse number 22 if I had not come and spoken unto them they had not had sin but now they have no cloak for their sin he that hateth me hateth my father also if I had not done among them the works which none other man did they had not had sin but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. Then he goes into chapter Chapter 16. Well, what's he talking about in chapter 16? Well, how about this? Verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then verse number 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Jesus said, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. You see, uh, for three chapters, and then he sums it all up again in his prayer in chapter 17. He tells his disciples, you're going to be in for some hard times. But it's not like you're alone. You know, church, this hope of glory that I've been preaching about for ten months, this hope of glory is in us 
Because God is in us. The God that we look forward to seeing face to face already has a residence right here with us. That hope comes from the fact that I'm not waiting to have relationship with God someday. I have relationship with God right now. A relationship that started when I was five years old and trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior. His Holy Spirit came to live within me. He's been there every day of my life. And even in times when my heart has condemned me, God has been greater than my heart. And even in days of great darkness, there's been hope. Why? Because it's not like I'm groping around trying to find where God is in my life. I know that God is in me. I know that He's come to take up a residence in me. And yes, there's been some rough times. And yes, there's been days when I didn't know what was going on or I didn't know what God was trying to accomplish. And, and, and there's been times of great confusion in my life. And yes, I've struggled with doubts. And yes, I've had my times of fear and worry. But the one thing I keep coming back to is this, that He lives in me. And the same one that lives in me also sits at the right hand of God and intercedes on my behalf. And I'm telling you, that is all the reason in the world to have hope, no matter how heavy life becomes. Because I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I can promise you this. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you're not alone. There's members of our church that are struggling right now. There's members of our church that are trying to keep their head above water right now. There's, there's turns that life has taken and life didn't even signal before it turned. It didn't give any advance notice. And if you don't know what I'm talking, talking about, everybody in here has been behind that car that just suddenly threw on the brakes and turned in a driveway and you almost ran into the back of them. Because they didn't give you any indication that that's what was going to happen. And all of us have been there with life and some are there right now and some don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and some there's just a lot of things that are being juggled right now and a lot of things that are up in the air and what's God going to do and how is this situation going to be resolved and it's looking pretty dark right now and, and, and times just seem tough right now. Can I encourage you tonight? No matter how tough things seem, there's hope. Because God's there. Well, I'm just not sure if He even sees what I'm going through right now. No, He sees. He's in you. And He sees what your struggle is. And He sees what you're going through. And you're saying, look, I... I'm worried about some direction in life and I'm, I'm worried about some decisions that I'm going to have to make and I don't want to make the wrong one. And I'm telling you, that can be daunting at times. Let me just tell you as a pastor, it's daunting at times. You know, I'm sitting here and you're looking at what's on pen and paper and you're looking at options and my goodness, we've got to have Sunday school space and we're going to have to build and we're getting some projects done and things like this, but the pen and paper doesn't always match the need. And man, I, I'm like anybody else. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to lead in the wrong direction. I find myself on my face constantly saying, God, I need you. God, I need your wisdom. God, I'm not, I, don't, I don't just want to do the right thing, but I want to do it the right way. So God, I need you. I need your help. I need your counsel. I need your word. I need understanding of your word. I need application of your word. And the truth is, burdens get heavy sometimes. But heaviness doesn't mean hopelessness. Because God's there. There was a Man, uh, years ago, when I was a kid, actually, Ron Hamilton, who wrote a song, Rejoice in the Lord, He Makes No Mistakes. 
He knoweth the end of each path that I take. And when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. And I've always liked this verse. I could not see through the shadows ahead. And I guess I identify with that verse because I know exactly what he's talking about. You're trying to navigate life and you're trying to make the right decisions and it seemed like the shadows on the path ahead are like Springfield streets at night when it's raining. Where do the lines go? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've been in other cities and the, the, it's like the lines almost get brighter at night in the rain. But in Springfield, the lines just disappear. You're like, I know I'm on asphalt, but I don't know where I'm driving here. And uh, it's like I, I couldn't see through the shadows ahead. I, I, didn't, I didn't know the right way, and I dare not trust my own judgment. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And it's probably in those times more than any other times I find myself so thankful that God's not gone anywhere. He's right there. He's no more than a prayer away. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, church, He might not answer your first request. And you might have to pray for a while. I didn't, I didn't mention this this morning. It wasn't part of the message. But if you were to read Daniel chapter 10, he prays for 21 days about something before he ever gets an answer. I find that interesting that in chapter 9, from the time he started praying, the messenger was sent forth and got there by the time he was done. But in chapter 10, he has to pray for 21 days before the answer comes. Church, you ever been there? There's times where you barely even thought to pray and God's already right there with the answer. And then there's times where you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you start wondering, is God ever going to answer my request? Is He ever going to fix this situation? Is this hopeless? And tonight I'm telling you, it might be heavy, but it's not hopeless. It's not hopeless. We're covered. We've got a God in heaven who cares. We got his son who sits at his right hand and intercedes for us as an advocate. And we have his Holy Spirit that actually dwells in us. And he's there to commune with our spirit. And I'm telling you, Jesus makes it plain to his disciples in John 14, 15, and 16. You're not praying to the Holy Spirit. You're not worshiping the Holy Spirit. What you're doing is you're seeking me. But he's the reason you can. And through him, I'm going to communicate to you. He's going to testify of me. He's going to remind you of what I have said. He will glorify me. But the fact that he's in you is a reason for us to hope no matter how heavy the situation becomes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. And God, we, I just feel like we need to be reminded.